The Dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins, by Barbara Curley, with drawings by Brian Selznick. Question of the week: How can paleontologists help us understand the past? London, 1853. Horse-drawn carriages clattered down the streets of London in 1853. Gentlemen tipped their hats to ladies passing by. Children ducked and dodged on their way to school. But Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins had no time to be out and about. Waterhouse, as he liked to call himself, hurried toward his workshop in a park south of town. He was expecting some very important visitors. He didn't want to be late. As he neared his workshop, Waterhouse thought of the hours he'd spent outside as a boy. Like many artists, he had grown up sketching the world around him. By the time he was a young man, he'd found his true passion: animals. He loved to draw and paint them, but what he really loved was sculpting models of them. Through his care and hard work, they seemed to come to life. Now Waterhouse was busy with a most exciting project. He was building dinosaurs. His creations would prowl the grounds of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert's new art and science museum, the Crystal Palace. Even though the English had found the first known dinosaur fossil many years before. And the bones of more dinosaurs had been unearthed in England since then. In 1853, most people had no idea what a dinosaur looked like. Scientists weren't sure either, for the only fossils were some bits and pieces, a tooth here, a bone there. But they thought that if they studied a fossil and compared it to a living animal, they could fill in the blanks. And so, with the help of scientist Richard Owen, who checked every muscle, bone, and spike. That's exactly what Waterhouse was doing. He wanted to create such perfect models that anyone, a crowd of curious children, England's leading scientists, even the Queen herself, could gaze at his dinosaurs and see into the past. Waterhouse threw open the doors to his workshop. Nervously, he tidied up here and there. His assistants came. Then Richard Owen. At last, the visitors arrived: Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. The Queen's eyes grew wide in surprise. Waterhouse's creatures were extraordinary. How on earth had he made them? He was happy to explain. The iguanodon, for instance, had teeth that were quite similar to the teeth of an iguana. The iguanodon then must surely have looked like a giant iguana. Waterhouse pointed out that the few iguanodon bones helped determine the model's size and proportion, and another bone, almost a spike, most likely sat on the nose like a rhino's horn. Just so for the megalosaurus. Start with its jawbone. Compare it to the anatomy of a lizard. Fill in the blanks, and voila, a dinosaur more than forty feet long. Waterhouse was also making ancient reptiles and amphibians. While Richard Owen could imagine their shapes, it took an artist to bring the animals to life. Designing the creatures was only the first step. There was still the monumental task of building them. Waterhouse showed his guests the small models he'd made, correct in every detail, from scales on the nose to nails on the toes. With the help of his assistants, he had formed the life-size clay figures and created the molds from them. Then he erected iron skeletons, 
built brick foundations, and covered the whole thing with cement casts from the dinosaur-shaped molds. It is no less, Waterhouse concluded, than building a house upon four columns. One, drawing. Two, small model, clay. Three, life-size model, clay. Four, mold. Five, iron skeleton, must support tons of dinosaur. Six, finished dinosaur. Bricks, tiles, and broken stones all held together with cement, covered with casts and paint. In the weeks to follow, Waterhouse basked in the glow of the Queen's approval. But he would soon face a much tougher set of critics, England's leading scientists. Waterhouse wanted to be accepted into this circle of eminent men. What would they think of his dinosaurs? There was only one way to find out. Waterhouse would show them. But why not do it with a little style? A dinner party, on New Year's Eve, no less. And not just any dinner party. Waterhouse would stage an event that no one would ever forget. He sketched 21 invitations to the top scientists and supporters of the day, the words inscribed on a drawing of a pterodactyl wing. He pored over menus with the caterer. The iguanodon mold was hauled outside. A platform was built, a tent erected. As the hour drew near, the table was elegantly set, and names of famous scientists, the fathers of paleontology, were strung above the tent walls. All was ready. With great anticipation, Waterhouse dressed for the occasion in his finest attire. He was ready to reveal his masterpiece. When the guests arrived, they gasped with delight. Waterhouse smiled as he signaled for dinner to begin. With solemn formality, the footmen served course after course from silver platters. Up and down the steps of the platform, they carried the lavish feast. Rabbit soup, fish, ham, and even pigeon pie. For dessert, there were nuts, pastries, pudding, and plums. For eight hours, the men rang in the new year. They laughed and shouted. They made speech after speech, toasting Waterhouse Hawkins. All the guests agreed. The Iguanodon was a marvelous success. By midnight, they were belting out a song created especially for the occasion. The jolly old beast is not deceased. There's life in him again. The next months passed by in concrete, stone, and iron as Waterhouse put the finishing touches on his dinosaurs. Inside the Iguanodon's lower jaw, he signed the work, B. Hawkins, Builder, 1854. The models were now ready for the grand opening of the Crystal Palace at Sydenham Park. Forty thousand spectators attended the regal ceremony. In the sun-filled center court, Waterhouse mingled with scientists and foreign dignitaries. At last, the Queen arrived. The crowd cheered, Hurrah! Cannons boomed, music swelled, and a choir of 1,000 voices sang. Waterhouse bowed before the Queen. Then she and Prince Albert invited the spectators to enjoy the amazing sights. Waterhouse hurried to the lake and waited for the crowd to arrive. First two, then ten, then a dozen more, gasped, shrieked, laughed, and cried. So this was a dinosaur! Afterward In 1868, 
Waterhouse traveled to the United States to create the first ever model of a complete dinosaur skeleton. The model went on display to amazed visitors of Philadelphia's Academy of Natural Sciences. Waterhouse also worked on making more dinosaur sculptures for a museum in New York City's Central Park. But before he could finish, vandals broke into his workshop, smashed the models to pieces, and buried them in the park. Today, pieces of the dinosaurs of Waterhouse Hawkins are still buried somewhere in Central Park.